Now, some of you have some vague no knowledge of what PDD is about. Yeah, a little bit. Slightly. BDD is not because you're just doing cucumber. You can't say I'm doing cucumber, so I'm doing BDD. It doesn't work that way. But we'll get on to that. Tonight we're going to be talking about yeah, behavior driven development. <laughs> the talk is called functional testing, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I've got some really cool examples to show you. And I thought it was a cool title. My name is John Smart, so I think so. I've already been slightly introduced, uh, slightly overstating the, uh, the facts probably. I work in the Agile space, so the technical side of Agile. So things like continuous integration, Jenkins, do a lot of work with Jenkins, uh, TDD, except I don't call it TDD, I just call it BDD, but applied at the coding level. I'm not going to talk about TDD or develop, this is a general talk for BAs and testers and everyone. So I am not going to talk about, don't get me started on TDD, please, or I won't stop. That's a subject that is that I really like. Uh, so just don't, no questions on that unless it's offline, because otherwise I just won't stop. And we won't actually talk about the real topic, which is BDD at the high level. Because there are two levels of BDD. Does everyone know that? Do people think that BDD is just for BAs? Yeah? Who does BDD when they do coding? No, I'm, I'm diverging here. BDD is for code, as BDD is for the whole team, and you are basically writing, applying behavior-driven development. You can apply behavior-driven development at any level, whether it's requirements or code or anything in between, or <coughs> functional require, non-functional requirements, performance. You can apply, apply BDD principles to all of that. Now we're getting to the Zen side of things. That's a different talk. Uh, yeah, wrote a couple of books. Do a lot of work with test automation as well. So uh, actually automating the acceptance criteria or automating regression tests. So that's very tightly coupled with this whole behavior driven development space. Uh, tonight, we are going to just be focusing on the BDD with acceptance criteria. So in Who's had the experience of working on an Agile project? You've all just done the Scrum course, yeah? you all just come out of the, you're all Scrum Master. Who's a Scrum, who's a certified Scrum Master? Quite a few, it's a cool course. So you go on, do your certified Scrum Master, really cool, you're happy, you come back. First iteration, first sprint, you're all cool. Takes a bit of while, no, you don't deliver much in the first sprint, yeah? But that's okay. Deliver a little bit. Second sprint, what happens? Deliver some features. Third sprint, you start measuring this velocity thing. And the, what happens to the velocity? Goes up, yeah? No, it sort of flat lines, it goes down, yeah? And then sprint after that. Last sprint, you delivered four features. Four usable things. This one you're only delivering three. What's going on? Next sprint, only two. What's going on? Anyone had that experience? Yeah? <laughs> Who has had that experience but what doesn't want to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> That's where your technical practices come into play. If you do if you do scrum or any agile approach without really solid technical practices, you will be up the proverbial creek without a paddle. Because everything will fall apart when you try and deliver at a regular pace <coughs> if you don't have really solid code quality and really solid uh, process, technical processes under the hood. If you don't have your test-driven development, your continuous integration, your continuous delivery, if you're at that stage, it's happened to my slide. <laughs> <coughs> you don't have all of these uh, things. If you're not practicing pair pro pair programming is cool, I like pair programming. You don't have to do it all the time, but it's really good practice for <coughs> sharing common knowledge among among the team, collective code ownership, all of those things. If you're not doing them, it's very hard to maintain decent quality. So you ask any uh, decent scrum practitioner, trainer, whatever. They will tell you this, you can't do scrum if you're not doing 
all of the technical practices. It just won't hold the root. So we haven't got time to talk about all of those practices, so we're just going to focus on one of them, acceptance criteria. So, you got all use, use story cards, yeah? You all got story cards? Yeah. Do you users care about story cards? Serious question, do users care about story cards? No. Matt, what do users care about? No, it's not clear. Sorry? Not everything is written. <laughs> Some things are written, not everything. What do users care about? Working software. Working software. What about it? What about it? They care about the features that are actually working for them. Story cards are just bits of paper on the wall that you move around to plan. They're planning artifacts. What users are really interested in are the features. Now, a feature may map to a story card, or may not. Maybe you've got a feature that needs a whole lot of story cards. Nevertheless, use story cards to plan how you deliver your features. And on the back of your story cards, you've got these, one, these acceptance criteria. Or is that a bit of a long assumption to make? <laughs> Who writes acceptance criteria on the back of their story cards? Who cannot fit the acceptance criteria on the back of the story card? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> so generally people are, you've got to the point where you actually write the acceptance criteria, which is really cool, because acceptance criteria are really, really important. They are the bridge between your features, your understanding of what needs to be done, and ensuring that it is actually done. Acceptance criteria, so there are two aspects that you need to know when you're trying to deliver software. You need to make sure the software works. Yeah, minor detail, but it is nice if the software works. It's nice that if you change a feature in one place, it doesn't break something else. That's sort of a nice to have, yeah. So you need to build solid software, you need to build the software right. But it is of limited value building software right if it doesn't actually do what the users need. So there is more leverage in making sure you build the right software than making sure you build the right software right. But if you build the right software and it's not built right, it uh, won't get you very far either. So you need both. You need to be able to build the right software, make sure it actually does genuinely do something that the users care about, and you have to build it right, build it in a way that it will <coughs> hold the root, that it will hang together when you actually have to put things in top of, on top of it, when you have to expand it, continue your, your process. And this is where your functional tests come into play. So fun when I say functional tests, I'm talking automated, or maybe manual as well. You've got, uh, I'm talking about the acceptance criteria expressed in terms of how you actually prove that your software does something useful. Have we got any testers in the room? Yep. Yeah. That's reassuring since the title of the talk is vaguely about testing. BAs, who, who, how many BAs do we have? I know there's a couple over here, yeah. A few and developers. <laughs> Scrum masters, innocent bystanders, <laughs> people who just came from Peter. <laughs> so, a good acceptance criteria is all about relating how you will demonstrate that your software does something valuable for the users. But that means you can't put it on your story card. You can't just jot down a full description of how you would demonstrate that the software works on the back of the story card. Yeah? They're just placeholders. They're like story cards themselves. They're just placeholders. You need to expand them into a more tangible form, into a more demonstrable form. That's where behavior development comes into place. That's where you use... Who has used BDD tools? I know the mild people have. 
allegedly. I haven't seen his action myself, but they seem to say they have. <laughs> who else? Spec flow? Who is a spec flow? No, some bird. Cucumber? Chay behave? Anything else? Inspect. Sorry? Inspect. Inspect. Yeah. For low level BDD testing. Yeah. Concordium. Concordium. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I know some contributors to Concordia. It's on, on video, so I won't say anything. Anyway, now I want to talk about how we actually do this stuff, practices. Now, one thing that's important to remember in this whole approach is the practices that are important. So it doesn't matter what tools you use, you can use Cucumber or even Concordium, uh, whatever, SpecFlow, JBehave, that's the approach that's important. You can use all of those tools and even NUnit or JUnit, you can use them for BDD effectively be harder to, but you can use them. It's not the tools that make the difference. And it's not the tools that mean that you're practicing something effectively. It's the approach. You need to understand the approach and have assimilated the BDD approach. Can anyone summarize? Anyone who's done a bit of BDD, do you know what I mean by saying the BDD approach? Anyone? Who's done a bit of BDD? My old people, you've done BDD apparently. What, what's the essence of behaviour-driven development? Um, you have a living document of specifications and you try to put some on that. Living document, yeah, living specifications, executable specifications. Anything else? That's a really important one, yeah. Any other? It's a common language, so you know, the same language being used between sort of the business domain all the way through to you know, the technical teams. Yep, so a common language, a ubiquitous language in terms of domain-driven development. So know that every if you come up with a specification, a requirement, uh, talking with your BAs and your testers, then the test reports will generate a report saying this feature works this way, here is the proof and it's in the language that the business can understand. That's a huge bonus for communication. But there's one really simple thing that we're, uh, no one's mentioned yet, maybe if I ask a few around a bit more, someone will, yeah? Executable specifications. Yep, we've had executable specifications. Yep, that's really important, anything else? Really simple one. Yes or no use. Yeah? Getting closer to the thing I'm trying to. It starts with user scenario, how a user is going to use it. And, and how do you get the user scenario? scenario? How do you get it? Feature based. How do you actually obtain that user scenario? From the user stories. Mm, yeah. Customers. Talking. Customers. Talking. 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 So, BDD is about conversation. Can't have BDD for daily conversation. You can have BDD without a single tool. I know people who do behavior different development with no tools at all. I find that boring. Yeah. I like the tools. But you can do BDD without tools. You lose a lot of the automation side of it. You lose the executable specification. But in some cases it does it is applicable. You take performance tests. Non-functional requirements. Is that something you can do with BDD? What happens if you apply BDD to non-functional requirements? Can someone give me a non-functional requirement? How many users does your system have to support? Hmm? Give me a number. More, yeah. So over, I don't know, 2,000 or, yeah. can you give me an example of how, uh, what sort of load your system has to support? Example. An example. Um, during Christmas time, yeah. ours is basically a credit company, so yeah. basically Christmas time is when we get hit. So we've got, let's say, 1,000 and we have got to have 
response was then 30 seconds. Yeah, so you just described a BDD requirement for specifications for performance. And now you may automate that or you may test it manually, but it's nevertheless a BDD style specification. That's the approach, it's a conversation. We just had a conversation, you told, gave me an example of your performance requirements, and now if we put that down, that can be something we can verify. It doesn't have to be with a tool. Maybe it will be with a tool, maybe it won't, it depends. But the important thing is getting that communication going, having that conversation. So the tools are kind of secondary. I have my preferences, you have your preferences, it doesn't make that much of a difference to see the approach, which is the most important thing. So testers, we've got some testers here, yeah? Those of you who are testers, when do you get involved in the pro a project typically? Requirements. Requirements, that's good. Mm. That's when you should get involved. That's when you should get involved. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you should get involved. But often it doesn't really work that way, does it? Especially in, I mean, a lot of the companies, I do a lot of work with banks and big government organisations, and uh, they're still in the approach where testers are basically in a different building and uh, more a different department and say, okay, we're, just send us the software when it's done and we'll test it. Anyone been in that situation? Anyone still in that situation? That's a painful situation to be. See, the problem with um, that situation, you probably, you've already sort of in, uh, implied by saying that they should be involved with requirements. You lose all the benefit, all the knowledge of testers if you wait till the end of the project. Yeah. You can do it, for sure. <laughs> so I'm going to deliver my software to you. Yeah, you're going to test it. You can come up with this brilliant idea. What am I going to say? Yeah, it would have been a good idea, but that was way too hard to change. You should have told me that at the start. So one of the big important things with regard to how testers collaborate is that BDD forces or encourages, strongly encourages them to participate at the start and not at the end. So in Agile, you're supposed to do that. BDD actually puts, uh, forces you to adopt that practice. Agile recommends it, says you should do it, but a lot of teams don't necessarily apply that to the letter. If you do a BDD, then it becomes a, you say, okay, how do we collaborate? We do this. We get together. Is it this, uh, who knows about the sphere these days? I'm not talking about the field. <laughs> So who's, who knows the Three Amigos approach? A couple. So the three, who does not? Okay, so the Three Amigos approach is a really powerful, powerful tool. In comes from, it's a, something that's often pra practiced by in BDD, and there are a few variations on it, but this is the, I find the most effective. In a nutshell, Three Amigos is you take your story card, you've got your acceptance criteria on the back of your story card. You know you've got to write this, implement this story. Before you start implementing it, at some point before, not too far, not too early, not too late, but it'll depend on the nature of your project, but uh, shortly before you start work, you drag a tester into a room, you get the VA, preferably the one who worked on the story originally, and you get a developer, and there may be other people involved as well. And you work through the acceptance criteria and turn them into executable specifications. Turn them into a form that developers can go with and actually implement. And once the developers have made those acceptance criteria, those executable specific specifications work, then the feature is done or well, the story is done. Very simple. The tricky bit is actually writing those acceptance criteria in a way that can be executed effectively, that covers all your bases and uh, still captures the essence of the requirement. And that's why you need a BA and a tester as well as a developer. You can't just have one person 
do it in isolation. That doesn't work very well. You really need to get three people together. So that's why the three amigos is a really, really valuable practice. If you want to take one practice away from tonight, take that one. Who's used it and can give me some feedback on that experience? Anyone? Yeah? Use it. Yeah? Yeah, we've been using it for the last years. Yeah? How do you find it? Oh, it's pretty young. Um, you feel you're part of the whole development process. Not the same at the end. Yeah. It also gives you the context right to the start. So it uh, helps you out what you're coming up with. And you get a much better buy in for yeah. everyone involved. And you get the chair, everyone gets a chance to contribute to say if a uh, requirement is fundamentally undoable or untestable or, or not useful. Testers have huge value for input, giving their input at that stage. It's really, really valuable. So this is another one that you're saying, living documentation. That's the flip side of executable requirements. Executable requirements means that you take your acceptance criteria, you express it in a form that can actually be part of the build, an, accept, uh, an automated test. And then every time the build gets the time the software change, the build gets executed, you run these acceptance criteria so you know where you're at. But the flip side of that is what if you write those executable specifications in a way that serves as documentation as well? Because what your executable specifications effectively should be is documentation explaining how you demonstrate that a feature does what it's supposed to do. And the side effect of that is that you end up with, if you do it right, you end up with a report that describes what the application does. You have to do it right so that you don't have too much detail or you don't have not enough detail, you have to have the right level of detail. Sometimes that involves having several executable specification reports. So there's several versions of the living documentation because the testers will want more in-depth details than the BAs or the product owners. But, and if you're doing web tests, then what you effectively have is an executable specification, a description of your application with screenshots. So an illustrated example of how you walk through the system for different, in different scenarios, in different use cases. And that's really, really powerful. So who's using, I don't know, Jira for story cards? Anyone? Uh, quite a few. Who's using some other electronic form of story card or internet? Yeah, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Do you work for Sorry? The Jira? Yeah. So there's quite a few of them around. If you use one of those, then you organise your requirements in a certain way. Yeah, you don't just have a random list of story cards. You have your story cards grouped by... How, how do you guys do it? So, yeah. so you've got epics and then stories inside. What about you guys? So, how do you organise? As minimally as possible. As minimally as possible? Yeah. So, but if you've got a certain number, you start to group them. Yeah. If you have too many, you start throwing them away. That's a good approach too. That's more can down approach. When you start grouping them in epics, Epic, uh, or another way you can group them, epics are interesting, epics are uh, kind of like a big story. You can also think in terms of features and capabilities and how you would organise a user's manual and categorise your features in those terms. If you organise your stories in that way, you put them in Jira, you structure, there are plugins in Jira that help you do that or you can just use a standard epic story, uh, whatever works for you. But if you do that, then you can tie your reporting into something like Jira so that your acceptance tests will be executed, will pull the data out of Jira. You won't just get a list of test results, you'll get a list of, well, a document that says, okay, here are the capabilities of the software, here's basically what it does in the chapter headings, here are the more detailed features, and here are some examples of how it actually works. And that's really powerful for, from the point of view of living documentation. But you don't want to keep the Siri, do you? You want to see the tools. Yeah? Who wants to see the tools? 
Yeah. Sorry, I don't have to show you the tools yet. Who's used a record replay to test it? Not that many. Who's been in a project who's used record replay tools? A couple. Who has enjoyed the who's enjoyed the experience? Yeah, the problem with record replay is that uh, it doesn't work, it's broken. It's a flawed concept from the start. It cannot possibly work for anything beyond a single page. It is fundamentally flawed, don't even go there. <coughs> if someone comes to you selling you a record replay tool, uh, they're just trying to sell you something, it won't work. Believe me, it won't work. Selenium has a record replay tool. The Selenium guys say, don't use it. Unless there are very limited cases where you might want to use it, but it's more in exploratory testing. It's not for automotive testing. So record replay in practice looks like this. In theory, it looks like really nice and shiny, but in practice, it's uh, a big mess. Why is it a big mess? Can anyone, anyone give me can anyone tell me why I'm saying this? Why I'm rubbishing record replay? These people have millions developing these great tools where you can click, 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 click. You play it and it plays, reruns the test perfectly. It's too fragile. Yeah. Yeah. Every time you touch the code, it's fine. Everything gets So if you've got a login screen, change the login screen, all of your tests break and you have to update them every time you use that login screen. So you get tools like, uh, What's the HP one? What's the HP one called? QTP. QTP, yeah. That's the one. Testers spend weeks maintaining these scripts. That's normal because that's what testers do. That's what many people think. Anyway, they sort of say, oh yeah, this is normal. They're spending all their time maintaining test scripts. They could have tested it manually at that time. But it doesn't matter. That's what testers do. You throw that concept at a developer and what sort of reaction will you get? It's just not going to happen. If you get uh, testers with a development background or developers to do the test automation, it's a whole different picture. Because you start applying engineering practices to test automation. You start not wanting to update a script in 20 places if you can only do it in one. You start wanting to be able to understand what the scripts do and having them not break every time something changes. So if you're doing test automation, especially for web layer, the, any sort of test automation really, but in particular web layer testing, you need to apply engineering practices. So developers basically need to be involved. It's a development task. Which leads me to my next slide. So it works briefly. It's a lot more to ogres than people Deal. think. Example? Example? Okay. Um, ogres are like onions. They stink? Yes. No. <laughs> oh, they make you cry. No. Oh, you leave them out in the sun, they get all brown, start sprouting little white hairs. No. Layers. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers. You get it. We both have layers. Oh, you both have layers. Oh. You know, not everybody likes onions. So what have functional tests and onions and ogres got in common? Layers. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a test without layers. Can anyone tell me what it does? Two loads. It's taking way too long to figure out what's in the registration form. Not that far, but you could have got that by looking at the. Unfortunately, this is the sort of test you see. That's a typical test that would be generated by a record replay tool. It's also 
the sort of test you see in tutorials about automated web testing. Quite often. You ask, you go onto the web and look up a Selenium tutorial, you get stuff like that. Not quite that bad, but that sort of stuff. And like most tutorials, it doesn't scale. Yeah. Can anyone see any sort of disadvantages of writing a test like that? The other one's total rubbish, but I mean, apart from that slightly other, slightly subjective opinion. Can't see what's happening. Yeah, can't see what's happening. Some you can't reuse it. Can't reuse it, yeah. Look at all these hard coded values everywhere. A better way is to use layers. And this is not rocket science. This is what any developer will do if they think in terms of production time. Strangely enough, often developers, when they start doing test automation, all their re production code reflexes sort of turn off. And it's probably something to do with the fact that people keep talking about test scripts. So please don't talk to me about test scripts. Yeah? I don't want to know about test scripts. Test scripts do not exist. Your test automation is equivalent to your production code and should be treated as such. The deliverable with the same value as your production code because it's what ensures that your production code has value. So it's something that is on the critical path to delivering production code. And if it takes too long to maintain, you can't understand it, then it's going to lose its value. So here is a slightly better approach. So what have we got here? We've got a uh, QCAR, uh, a baby, uh, a acceptance criteria. So our acceptance criteria is, can everyone see what the acceptance criteria is trying to demonstrate? I probably don't have to read it. If you were a tester, would you be able to look at that and say, yeah, I'll just test it? Yeah. Might be a tad high level at this stage, but that's the goal of the test. Yeah. It's the goal of the requirement. That's where we start. We don't start with the whole long script. We start with the goals. We start with what we're trying to achieve in business terms. So that's why when I say writing uh, just because you're doing Cucumber doesn't mean you're doing BDD. BDD is an approach. You need to be able to pitch your stories at the right level. Otherwise, they'll become just as unmaintainable as the script we saw earlier. So using JBehavior Cucumber or SpecFlow is not a guarantee of uh, high quality texts. You need to apply good practices as well. So I start off with a business level requirement and then then we'll actually implement it. Can everyone read that? Is that, because, is that readable? Can everyone read the... Uh, it says JBAC. But it would be the same in... Very similar in Cucumber and uh, similar in C-sharp for, uh, for Spectlow. You'd, you'd have a similar... You could have a similar approach. Now what you notice about this particular acceptance criteria that I've just thought about? Parameterized. I haven't talked about buttons or clicking or HTML steps. So, so I'm breaking it down into steps. So I've got, okay, the name, given that some, when someone registers, it's not just a list of clicks and entering field values. It's in, in, broken down into re, reusable steps. We can reuse those steps, and we can also read them. So earlier on, I mentioned the good acceptance criteria tells a story. Here we're telling a story. You want to register. So what do you do? You register as user. You should receive a confirmation mail. And you should, and then you confirm the email address. So behind each of 
uh, these, the should receive confirmation email at user.email address. And confirms email address. There's a lot of stuff going on behind it. This is really walking a uh, user journey through the system to do something. If you had to detail everything that you had to do to achieve that, it would be two pages long just for that step. But we don't want that because the more information you have, the less you can actually understand what's going on. So you want to summarize it, break it down into steps. It's what I call the business plan. And then, and only then, so we take registers as users, for example. Only then do we actually start talking about how you do that in terms of the web interface. <coughs> so here we've got the home page, uh, we've got a registration page that we get to by registering on the home page. We enter login details from the member, we uh, enter the, con the contact details, we accept the terms and conditions and so forth. But it's the same thing as we saw earlier, we're still breaking it down into steps, just lower level steps. Because again, I think this would be too high level to start talking about clicking on stuff. Too high level and I wouldn't get any readers. That's only once I decide that, that I'll actually implement this page object, this class that encapsulates the web page and actually do the interactions with the web page. So that is how you write an automated acceptance criteria if you want to be able to maintain the three months down the track. Not hard, it's just applying engineering principles. Who is working that? I know some of you are using page objects. Yeah? How are you finding it? Lovely. I mean, it looks like a lot of code there, yeah? Looks like you'd write a lot of code to get something done. No, but it actually gets quite simple though, because we're only sort of thinking about it going, okay, we've got one class which is you know, probably you know, the pages. We don't have to define the class again, we have to define you know, how do we get to a certain input or how do we click a certain field once, and um, we can reuse that code step as well. Yeah, so it actually ends up you save a lot of time because you're only defining, you're centralizing the information about how to interact with a page, or it doesn't have to be a page, it can be part of a page. If you've got a menu bar, or if you've got a list of uh, shopping cart items or something, anything that's reusable, you can make a page object out of it or a page component and have that as a reusable logic that you reuse throughout your tests. So any interaction, you only need to model it once and then you get this huge leverage of what you've already modeled. So you start up, putting a bit of time into implementing the infrastructure up front, a few hours maybe, it's not huge, but it's pretty quick. And then you can really churn out the tests and they become maintainable, which is a huge benefit. So in a nutshell, what we've done here, we've got, I've defined four layers. Really, we talk about three layers. We talk about a business rule or a business requirement layer. We talk about a business flow layer and then the technical layer. I'd break the technical layer into, for web applications at least, into page interactions and page details. So we've got four layers. We've got a business rule. We've got the flow through the system. We've got the implementation of a particular step in terms of what you do with the actual pages and then we've got the details of the page. <coughs> and like this example is using uh, jbehave and, uh, uh, and Java but that's exactly the same principle as you, you'd use the same thing in pretty much any language, it's just the change is very, uh, very little. Got, um, I work with clients who do this with SpecFlow as well, so I mean .NET. That's the approach which is important. So I did put a mention on my show So I did a bit of a survey just to know what people around the place were using. So this is totally unscientific, but it gives an interesting indication. This is Concordia and actually has six. Uh, when I asked basically who 
what BBD two will be using. I deliberately mix it up because there are two levels of BBD. There's BBD for the coding level. Someone was talking about NSpec. Uh, so that's a bit low level BBD. Uh, so that's Scala as well. I think there are some people doing Scala. That uh, Scala has excellent BBD style testing libraries. But the TDD level, the unit testing level. Uh, if you're doing TDD, don't just do TDD. Do, do BBD and coding. Well, just on slight aside, because I find it really fascinating. Yeah. TDD is great, it makes solid software, makes it easier to reuse, uh, forces you to think about the design up front. Use BDD at coding level, on the other hand, it takes it a step further. If BDD at the coding level, now we saw you start with the business requirements and you work down through the acceptance criteria. Think the same thing for your unit tests. What do you end up with? There you've got living documentation for your application. What happens if you do the same approach for unit tests? Someone is doing, who was using uh, NSpec? Unit yeah. tests. Yeah. And how do you write the tests? Sorry? In what terms do you write the NSpec? Yeah. And when you write those end spec stories, you're basically on the NSPEC specifications. You're not saying test bank transfer or test deposit. You're saying or test you're saying should transfer money to foreign account or should transfer or should yeah. uh, you're saying what the software should do at an API level. And suddenly, you no longer have tests, you have technical documentation. And so for maintenance, it's huge. You come in, you look at the code, you'll be, I can show you some examples if you're on offline, I can show you the, <coughs> the examples of what this sort of stuff looks like. You'll come into a code base and you'll be able to just understand what it does purely by looking at the BDD acceptance, uh, BDD unit tests. Because it's basically a list of the low-level specifications of the APIs, including examples. What more can you offer? That's huge. That's really, really powerful. So that's for the BDD side of it. There, is, there are a few people using fitness. Who's using fitness? Fitness, uh, what do you think fitness? I like it. Yeah. It's, good for a, it's good for what we were using it for. You know, I think all of these things are mm. not applied universally, but they're good things that they can choose on. Fitness was revolutionary when it first came out. Yeah, I mean, it's been around about 10 years. years ago that I was Yeah, I mean, it's been around for 10, 15, no, maybe not 15, but I think it's a very early 2000s fitness. It was one of the first 80 did the automated acceptance testing tools. It's ta all table based. The risk of fitness is it's good if you were thinking in terms of tables, but you tend to end up with everything being a table. Uh, it's getting a little long in the tooth now as well. Uh, other tools, this other category of tools is 40%, uh, what I call the given when then tool. So it's your cucumbers, your specflow, your jbehave, uh, what else have we got there? That's all the ones that actually require, but there are others. Uh, in every language nowadays has that given when then style CDD tool. Uh, let's have a look at a couple of tools and just throw them out there and see what people think. WebDriver, this uh, WebDriver is my favorite web testing, web automation tool. Who to use WebDriver in one form or another? Yeah. WebDriver is really powerful, especially, but uh, I'll usually throw something on top of it to make it a bit more usable, reusable and uh, a little bit more expressive. But yeah, WebDriver is really good. Uh, what else are we talking about? If you take WebDriver, who's used, uh, anyone use SourceLabs? You know what source hubs is? Anyway, use the Selenium grid. Yeah. So the idea of uh, one of the problems with web tests is you can have too many of them and they can get very slow. You have heaps of them. Sometimes you really do need to have web tests. Sometimes you don't. That's a different question. But if you do need to have lots of web tests, maybe you need to test across different platforms, across different OSs or different browsers. 
you can use something like either Selenium Hub, uh, you can set it up locally, a little server that you set up internally, or there are online services like Source Labs. I think there's another one as well now uh, that I don't recall the name of. But the online services where you say, okay, I want to run my test on Windows, Unix, Mac, with Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, and it will just fire off all of your tests. They're not particularly uh, fast individually, but when you put them all together, since you're running uh, 20 test strings in parallel, you get some significant benefits. And the same applies to Selenium Bridge, just that so you set it up on your local uh, local network. You dedicate a machine to managing that ramp up and scale down. And you get a whole lot of virtual boxes or physical machines and make them your slaves for this central hub. Works really well in a continuous integration environment. So that's because one of the fundamental things with continuous integration, again a slide aside, is feedback time. I once was doing some work for a company in the UK and they uh, had a continuous integration box. I mean, they had all their automated tests, it was really well done, but the problem was continuous integration box was saturated. So the test would take three hours to run. But it was better than that because since everybody was pushing their changes to different projects, the test, the build server can only do so much. So sometimes the test would take two or three days to actually get a result. By which time there'd be 50 other commits to the project. So if it broke, there's no way of knowing what actually went wrong. Which kind of defeated the purpose of continuous integration. So the point of this sort of architecture is that you want really snappy tests, whether it be uh, unit tests, your unit tests, your unit tests, you should have thousands of them within less than a minute or a few minutes. You should be able to run thousands of unit tests. That should, that should be a no-brainer. Your web tests, your integration tests, your end-to-end -end tests, shouldn't, uh, well, depending on your scale, but you don't want it to be more than half an hour maximum, an hour maybe. Uh, you want to have very fast turnaround so that you can get significant information quickly. That's, that's really important. He's doing mobile. I know you're, you, my own guys starting to do a bit of mobile, yeah? There's this cool tool called Appium. Have you heard of Appium? If you know WebDriver, Appium's really easy because Appium is basically a WebDriver API that you can use to test your mobile devices, your mobile apps. So it's a slightly simplified version of the WebDriver API because not everything works on the same on a mobile app as on a HTML page, but it's still pretty powerful. So that's worth noting if you're doing any application, any web apps, or any mobile apps. Uh, there are lots and lots of, depending on your personal preferences, lots and lots of tools, like I was saying, that go on top of so that's not quite true, there is support for page objects, it's just third party. There are tools that go on top of WebDriver. So if you who uses Ruby? Anyone using Ruby? Yeah, a couple of people. Water, if you use water. So water is a DSL, a Ruby DSL that goes on top of WebDriver and makes for very expressive uh, web tests. In the JVM world, anyone using Groovy? Who's used Groovy? Anyone? Groovy is sort of the Java equivalent of Ruby. It's a scripting language on top of uh, on top of Groovy, on top of Java, and you get the same sort of thing. You get very expressive library tests. Uh, what else have we got? Then your BDD tools. So some of you started to use stuff like this. You get all of your J behavior key coming in. Thank you. Some of you have already, if you looked into BDD, you thought you would come across these. Now, the thing about these is they are high level BDD tools. You don't want to use them for unit testing. You use them when you are communicating between BAs, testers, and developers. Their value is in their communication. The value is in their reporting, not in the test automation. Test automation is easy. You can do it with JUnit or NUnit, not a big deal. 
the communication of these two, on the other hand, is very powerful, and that's where they, they start to shine. Uh, so um, I think I'm running out of time, so what I will do is skip ahead a little bit and get to a demo. Who wants to see a demo? No one? Okay, we can go home then. Oh, so who wants to see a demo? Okay, so let's have a look. Actually, I will walk that, just to know where we are. So this, who is familiar with this format for acceptance criteria? Who is not familiar with this format? Who hasn't seen a pilot before? So everyone has, pretty much, almost. So this is what an acceptance criteria looks like in JBabe or Cucumber. You express, this one's JBehave, you express your high level requirement in the, usually in a given when then format, or you can have a tabular format as well. The idea is that's readable, that can be used by the business. And then you go and take that and implement it in Java or .NET or whatever. So that's a little bit what we saw earlier on. So now we're going to take that and see what it does as far as living documentation goes. So what I want to show you is I'll share the screen and show you some real code. So this is a little acceptance criteria, but so this is this is a demo application, some acceptance criteria for a very simple web test for a site that's a little bit like eBay. So what we're trying to prove here, we want to search for listings by a keyword in a particular category and you expect to have a certain title. So when we search the cats in the art category, you will get the Retro Coaster High School Health Cats book. That's true. And dogs were just very boring. Dogs are boring, apparently you only get dogs. That's the examples we're looking for. So if I go... So here's the implementation of those. That's a little bit simpler than what we saw earlier. We're going straight to the pages. So we've got, we open a search page, we search for keywords on the search page, we select a category and then we search for keywords in that category and that will take us to the results page. The results page should display titles with the keyword. So again, we're encapsulating all the HTML logic inside these page objects and only exposing a reusable API. So if I do select category, here we've got in that categories list, we find an element by link text and click on it. So this is pretty standard Selenium stuff. Uh, click on a link, uh, there's nothing really fancy here. Just standard Selenium code. And when we run that, I won't bore you because uh, we've got some time for the other speakers as well. When we run that, we will get something like this. So this is a tool called Thucydides, which is something uh, uh, my company has worked on. It's an open source tool. But, uh, that goes on top of JBehave or tools slightly lesser extent, Cucumber and SpecFlow, tools like that, and gives you reporting in the terms of living documentation. So here, for example, we have the test that we just run, that we just looked at. So we were looking at given looking for items in a particular keyword. So here's our test. <coughs> Can look at this documentation, find out about the story that it came from, what the examples were, and then get the actual living documentation side of it. We say, okay, given I want to find a category when I search for cats and I could see retro post high school cats, I'll click on that, and this is where the screenshots the web drive generates uh, quite nice. You get a little walkthrough of the application. Uh, showing how your feature is important. So you apply that to a whole application and you end up with basically living documentation, living examples of every feature in your application. 
Uh, so that's that's quite nice. But one interesting thing: test results are great, but test results only tell you about the tests that were executed. They don't tell you about what features were tested, and they certainly don't tell you about what features were implemented. And they really don't tell you about what features weren't implemented. Yeah. So test reports can tell, only tell you so much. So what we do is we tie the, the test reports. So here we had, cool, we're 83% done. Let's get some information from JIRA and have a look at the story cards in JIRA and see how many tests actually map back to the story cards in JIRA. And it's not quite so pretty. We've only got 36% done when we actually go to JIRA and look at all the stories and say, okay, what's actually been done and what were we supposed to do in this sprint? And so here we can say, oh, we had to, this sprint where we're trying to do browsing listings, my train me and post a listing. So I got 50% of the tests were written for the first two and nothing at all for the second last one. And we might drill down into browsing listings to see that's a more finer tuned feature. So you do the feature breakdown that you're interested in browsing by category, section for listings and so forth. You can see one's uh, got some tests, but browsing by category either hasn't been implemented or hasn't got any tests at all, which is in agile terms, is the same thing. So that's what I mean by living documentation. It's not an abstract concept, it's very practical. You want documentation that reports not only the test results, because a test result, a test report can do that. You want reports that describe the requirements and describe how the features in your application have been implemented and from a project point of view, what has been implemented and what hasn't. So that, that in a nutshell, that's uh, probably the most important thing from my perspective, what living documentation is about. So I think I've probably got over time, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So if you do want to learn more about this stuff, I um, almost finished a book called BDD in Action by the Manning, which has a lot of this stuff in it. Um, there are a couple of trading courses. There's some growth, some flyers floating around the place, coming up in November on this stuff. One is focused it's a one day workshop focused on the BDD for BAs, testers, devs, collaboration. And the other one is a two day workshop which is more the TDD development BDD. So feel free to come and chat to me afterwards if you want to know more. Uh, what else is interesting there? The tool we were using there is Thucydides. So the website is thucydides.info. And uh, there's also lots of more resources on the Wacker list. Yeah. So I'm um, probably way out of time. So let's see. Can we have time for questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Questions, anyway. Any questions? Or have I exhausted it? I've already intimidated you too much by asking you questions. Yeah. I would. Uh, uh, Felix from Apex. Uh, we always actually hear uh, people say that BDD are very high maintenance because sometimes uh, blackness or sometimes it doesn't really work on it and it takes, it takes long to actually run. And there's some tools that um, basically constrain you to only test certain browsers as well. Now, that's why people start directing it for to TDD versus BDD. Now, um, my question would be, is it value to start BDD for every single story? Or is it more value when you get like an end to end functionality? Then you do that finishing BDD. If you're doing end to end functionality, then it's not BDD, it's regression tests. Yep. Or which has value. But it's not the same value as the BDD of the staff, which is in the conversation. So I'll get back to what I was talking about earlier. The value of BDD is the conversation, and the automation is sort of the icing on the cake. Uh, you need to 
you get a lot of value out of this automation, but if you automate every nook and cranny of your application, you will get lots of tests and it can be an overhead. You want to be able to know, think of BDD, high level BDD acceptance criteria in terms of they are an example of what the application does. They illustrate the application. They don't test it exhaustively. Your unit tests, which you can also do in a BDD style, but more things like NSPEC or a Spock for Java, more low-level uh, BDD style tools, they're really good for the technical documentation, but that's different, that's more the TDD level. But your acceptance tests, if you write them this way, the way I've been describing, uh, that helps a lot with maintenance. But still, you want to, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to fall in the trap of writing BDD requirements, automated specifications that are always way too detailed and way too technical. There's an art to pitching them at the right level so they can be maintained. Did that answer the question? Did that answer the question? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, I actually had a follow-up. So like the domain-driven design people, right, they'll tell you, for instance, don't use DDD for everything. Like it's, it's a powerful tool, but you should think about which parts of your business it's really valuable for. Yeah. So as a follow-up question, like, do you see BDD that same way? Which is to say, are there sort of projects that you should have identified that these are important for that communication to happen? You're willing to sort of go through that? Or do you see it as a universal practice that you would rather, you, you probably wouldn't develop anything without following it? <coughs> well, it depends on what you call BDD. If you're talking about doing the Cucumber, JBehave type BDD, where you're doing these, uh, given when then specs. I wouldn't do it for every project. I'd do it for the project where there is value in getting that collaboration between BAs, testers, and developers. If you're working on a project uh, with a, develop, a small development team, and if it's an internal project, or if, it's, if the communication to external stakeholders isn't that important, does that exist? Research project, maybe. Uh, then there would be less value in the BDD side of it. The prototyping, maybe you're doing a prototype, in which case you just want to get something up and running and working and demonstratable. Start lean startups, that approach. Uh, you're not necessarily <coughs> going to get the value out of the automation, but you may well get the value out of the conversation. So yeah, there's a trade. There's always a, uh, there are nuances in how you want to apply it. Uh, is there a difference between acceptance test driven development and behavior driven development? Acceptance test driven development is, uh, well it's an older term, it comes, predates behavior driven development, it's more used for things like fixture, or was more used for tool like fixture. Mm -hmm. Now it's sort of synonymous, except that acceptance test driven development focuses on the acceptance test at a higher level, a little bit more on the automation, a little bit less on the, on the conversation, so there's sort of a nuance. It's a, I'd say it's a tool within BDD, you know, right. and BDD also <coughs> applies at the TDD level, Dr. Coden. Yes. Okay. Um, too many living documents. That's the end of the question I had. Where you kind of end up uh, creating new feature files as you keep adding stuff. Um, the question goes back to how do you organize it? So you can quickly go and find where your best are. Do you see an industry practice that you can focus on the ways of that? The practice is, for one thing, the feature files need to talk about features, not stories. Uh, so they are focused in terms of the way you would write a user manual, just so they are illustrations of the software, not thinking in terms of tests. So uh, you've got to think of the BDD style tests as acceptance tests that, are, that illustrate, that demonstrate the software. You may have functional, automated functional tests, which are a separate category, and you may or may not use BDD tools for that. But your living documentation is a subset of what the application does. It will have nowhere near full coverage. But full coverage for even integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, is illusionary. You cannot have, uh, is everyone happy with that concept? You cannot have 100% coverage with acceptance tests or integration tests. Or do I have to prove it mathematically? Integration tests, it is impossible to have 100% coverage. So don't even try. They are for examples. They're just illustrations of how the software works. Unit tests, you can have 100% coverage. Very easy, but not integration or end-to-end or end tests. So you don't try. 
you show them as examples of the business rules to illustrate, to demonstrate to the business what, what you're doing and what you have to do. And, and then you may trim them later on. You, you may get several, you can refactor into a single example. And you organize them in terms of your requirements. So you don't just have a big directory full of feature files. You categorize them. So with Cucumber, you can put tags or annotations. You categorize them in terms of your stories, your stories, your requirements, your features, your ethics, however you organize your requirements and categorize them that way. Or you put them in Okay. Yes. Who is the conversation between when you're doing BDD at the code level? Sorry? Who is the conversation between when you're doing BDD at the code level? Yourself. You start with a story, your requirements and the acceptance criteria, then you implement uh, that. But the conversation is, if I were using this code as another developer, how would I like it to behave? Or what is the next thing this uh, API should do? So it's less conversation focused, it's more documentation, technical documentation. Any more questions? Yes. Okay, I'd like to thank John. Can everybody be great for <laughs> um, We have one more talk, and that is from Mike Shannon and Rob Manger from here at MYB, and they'd like to tell you a little bit about MYB's BDD journey. Thank you. So thank you very much John, thanks Mandy, and thanks for everyone for staying so late on a Thursday night. Um, I have a really quick story, hopefully no more than 10, maybe 15 minutes if there are any questions after that, feel free to ask. Um, but really wanted to talk about, you know, a lot of people approach BDD from a Greenfields project and that can be a lot of fun and, you know, challenging and you don't, and you've got freedom, you don't have any legacy behind you. But, you know, what happens if you do have um, quite a sizable legacy test automation suite. Um, so, Michael and myself, so we're part of the QA team here at NYB, um, just wanted to take you through a really quick journey um, of what's been happening over the last couple of years. So, kind of covering the, the before, you know, the traditional test automation um, mentality, you know, automate everything, trying to get that 100% coverage. Um, Moving on through to the uh, you know the beginning BDD you know there's this new fandangled thing called BDD you know what is it all about let's give it a go and, and learn something about it um, you know falling into some of the traps that that you can fall into if you if you don't do things in an organised way um, and then you know going through the process of taking a step back and starting to do it better you know taking learnings from the industry people like John and some of the books that he's written as well as now attending conferences like Agile Australia, and, and etc. So um, to take you through, or to begin taking you through the journey, I'd like to hand over to Michael. Okay, so some of our reasons that we had to move was we had a test suite that when we ran it, it took over two days to execute. Now the reason for the quick feedback, we wanted quick feedback, but it took us over two days to get any responses. So. This test suite was owned by the QAs. There was no collaboration between the BAs or the development. Now, often times a developer would have a feature file or some work to do, so he checks it in. And asks, can you now test it? So we test it. All good. Then, it'll come, then we go, oh, by the way, can you run some of those tests that you've got over there? I want to make sure they haven't broken the system. Okay, so we go, okay, we'll test it. We run the tests. By the time he got feedback, it was actually faster for us to manually test the test than actually get the feedback from the test results, which was not a good situation for us. So in the end, it turned out, because these tests are running, oh, we had a lot of failures. But a lot of these failures weren't caught from bad code from the developers. It was just they were just brittle. So we actually spent up more time fixing the automation framework than actually coding and testing our suite. So obviously, from this point of a time was more likely that we this was not sustainable and we had to look elsewhere. So we decided to move on. So some of the considerations that we had to do. Well we are, as our main core set, we had this lecture test suite was written in a language that only the QAs knew. Let's scrap that. Let's pick a 
of the framework that we are comfortable with that involves developers. We're a .NET shop, so this use a tool that supports .NET and it makes sense. We want everyone on this journey, not just the QOs. What was the experience of our team? We had excellent domain knowledge of our product. We knew it inside out, so that's great. But how much of experience of those people who are primarily manual testers, how can we get them to write our automation test suite? So we wanted to bring our developers in, who knew were very technical. We've got the other group of manual testers. We can use their, their manual knowledge, combine them to make our test suite that's really going to fly and hum. But then we've got to take into consideration the cost. How, how hard is it to do? How much effort does it take to get to this suite? We had two approaches we could have done. There was one, let's do it all in one big hit. Or two, let's try to do it as part of our project work. So if we do a project that's affect some of these tests, let's move them across. So we decided to actually move them as a part of our project. We thought the big, big bang theory for us was not going to deliver the results we wanted without jeopardising any of our deliverables. So how do, we, how do we implement it? You look at a suite, there's 600 odd tests. It's where do I start? It's a needle in a haystack. Let's pick this, let's pick that. No, let's do this. We weren't not sure of what we are going to do. So where do we start? We chose ones that are the highest value to our, our business stakeholders. We chose them out of our list. Then for us as QAs, as we're learning, let's pick the easy ones first and let's use them to build our knowledge up. Let's build our confidence by using such a small set and use those smaller tests to actually move across to the more complex flows and use what we learnt there and apply them onto the harder scale. So now we're flying. So we're writing these feature files, great. Everyone's getting involved, throwing everything in. And we still have the traditional mindset, we want to automate everything. And what was what started happening to our build times? They got slow. Tests started to break. And then guess what? Were, were we going to make another legacy, a legacy suite? It was. It was started to have those syndications. Tests were failing, slow feedback. We don't want that. Let's stop. Let's slow down. We had no standards in place. So one of the first things we did, we removed the term BDD. Why? It was <coughs> We, when we used the word term BDD, that was referring to a UI test. But we did not want just UI tests. We wanted integration tests. We wanted unit tests. So we started calling them what they actually are, which are UI, inter -test, integration tests. It just happens they use BDD techniques. So we decided, let's remove that term. Next, we started to get away from our functional test and start moving to a behavioural test. We had tests that were clicking here, select this, click here, click that. But it wasn't very maintainable in the long run if we ever decided to change the product. So we actually learned how to write behavioural type tests. So I log in here, I log in here. So another step we did after that. People were writing all those terms, starting using the terms I log in. But then it got a bit confusing for us. People started using I edit, I save, I record. But no one knew what that meant. Does an edit involve a save? I don't know. I change. Does that do a save or it just changes something? So what we had to do as a group come together, what is our common terminology? And it turns out that once we started using that common language, when someone else picked up the test, they knew exactly what they had to do or what words they had to use. And the next thing was, as people were throwing stuff in, there was different implementations of everything we wanted to do. We want to click a button, we had like five ways to click a button. Let's standardise the way so we have one standard approach. We wanted one way to do this, so people can pick it up and say, I need to click something. Oh, I know how to do that. Or I want to enter something in a text box. Okay, I know how to do that straightforward. So we made it quite simple. And then we started to fly. And now I'm going to hand over to Rob to do the next part of our journey. Thank you. Um, so as Michael said, you know, the team was really eager and we jumped in and, and we um, were really learning the tools and, and even though you know, it was tough, we were still excited about you know, process improvement and stuff like that. Um, the key driving force for this was we were impl implementing BDD for progression testing anyway. So the question is, is what happens with all this legacy stuff? Um, because we're implementing BDD, we're transitioning to Agile, QAs were now getting involved right up front and in requirements definition. Um, because of that collaboration, the automation was now happening at, at the right levels. You know, we had a more collaboration between with devs to know what was actually being unit tested. 
you know, what level was in, at the integration level or what was being automated at the integration level, um, and therefore defining what needed to be automated at the UI level. Um, because of that collaboration with the devs, you know, the automation is now incorporated in the continuous integration pipeline, um, which is giving us a lot quicker feedback, not just in terms of the test results, but also in terms of the quality of the test. So as Mike said, we, when we first started out, we had some really long-running tests. I think the, my favourite example is we had three tests that took over one hour to run. Because that was visible, and with the help of the devs, we got that down to around three minutes for those same three tests. Um, so because we're talking at the same time, QA's at the start of the project, our BD, ATDD, whatever you want to call them, our, our plain English tests, were being written and tested and automated in parallel with development, right from the beginning of the development uh, process. And this is the point where the legacy test migration kind of comes back into the picture, you know, we were analysing what was, you know, part of the legacy test suite, we were um, determining what was handled by our progression test automation, and we had that discussion of anything that wasn't covered, that we still felt needed to be automated, we'd write up the test card and that would be included in the project, you know, business as usual everyday test effort, or development effort, to automate these parts that, were, that had been covered by the, the legacy test suite. Yeah, and as we're moving forward, you know, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting to a point where we can start uh, replacing the manual regression test effort with what is being automated. I think in, in an upcoming release, we're looking, or well, the aim is to replace a two week regression, a manual regression cycle, and cut that down to one week of manual. With, with one week's worth of testing being covered by automation. Um, and the next step that we're, that we're approaching is you know, retiring that legacy automation suite. You know, we're now embracing the, the uh, mentality of, you know, we, we can throw away some of these scripts. They don't need to be automated. They're covered by automation. Um, and as I said, we're not, not quite there yet. We, you know, we're getting faster. We're continually asking ourselves, how can we improve what we're doing? You know, we're starting to take part, uh, take part in in you know industry. We, we're talking with people like John. We're, we're learning better ways of doing things. Um, oops, I'm a bit bright. Um, and yeah, so so we're looking at what people do things, but. And the key problem is, is that a lot of people try and fit a square peg in a round hole. We're not approaching it that way. We're, we're looking at what people are doing. That doesn't quite fit what we need to do, but this little bit, we'll, we can take that and kind of retrofit it into the way we're doing it. Um, and that's really all we have to say today. Um, any questions? Uh, you mentioned that there was a handful of tests that were that surfaced as part of this process. We made an order of magnitude improvement on the performance. It went from over 60 minutes to three minutes. Yeah. Um, was that was that a function of the tests, or was that feedback on the code? Like, where was the big win on that? Um, yep. So obviously, we all heard about the, the testing pyramid. And obviously, when they when we first decided to write the test, there was no underlying test. So our only solution was was to write one test that covered everything. So as we as we got better at doing it, we were talking to the developers. And there's no, we've actually got some unit tests and some integration tests. So you don't know, need to go into so much depth at the UI level. So therefore, we are able to cut back those tests. Okay, so it was, it was really stripping away some yeah. stuff that wasn't valuable to really get to the meat. Yeah. And I think another thing on top of that is, um, you know, as we approached it, we were still trying to functionally or automate the functional testing of moving towards the behaviour mentality, what is the key behaviour that we're trying to test here? That also cut out a lot of the fat of the testing. Anything else? Yeah, we're eager to get home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got a question here. Yeah. Yep. Did you have any part of AC personnel? Do you need to test, for example? 
there was an email that you wanted me to send <coughs> something that was not like at the end of the test you could actually verify that it has been done or not, you have to wait or yeah. Currently we don't have any of those tests that do that sort of thing. As we've just had it, which is a record, we've got a result, so we don't have to worry about those timings as much. One thing of, from my previous experience um, in that scenario is, and as John said, the, the whole concept of not everything needs to be automated. So for a step like that, um, there are ways you can do it. You can set up a public Gmail folder and send an email there and then automate Gmail. Yeah. Anything can be automated if you've got the time yet. Um, but sometimes you make the call for this step, we'll manually test that step over here. But all, the, all, this, all these other steps can be automated. Um, you mentioned that uh, you had quite a few weeks of manual version testing when you first dropped it down to one week. What was the step by doing that? Like, did you actually get every developer to start automating all the tests and your testing? Or? Yep, so obviously we've got areas that we're doing project work on. And as we do get our confidence in the level of coverage of the unit tests, it means we had to do less manual regression site. Actually doing less manual regression testing. Because we've got the faith in our frameworks that we get the correct results. So therefore we're able to cut back the amount of manual regression and actually start doing exploratory testing. So therefore we can actually cut back the amount of manual we had to do. Uh, so every automation is actually cut back all the first manual yeah. regression so testing at the same time. Yeah. So every Module, once we got happy with our coverage, because we don't need to spend a day regression testing it. We know we only need to spend half an hour to an hour instead, because we got that faith. So there's one on this side. Oh, in the testing pyramid you showed, like you had a yep. unit test, integration test, and VDD. So just coming from the presentation before, because yep. functional tests were not there, but we need to be much more detailed in what we need. So is it like you covered everything functional testing into VDD? Yeah. So our functional test is sort of like at the integration type level and our, our high UI would be at the end-to-end -end scenarios where it goes through several screens but we'd write more tests at the lower levels which so that's the way we could actually cut down our UI type testing and create more tests at a lower level. But at the lower level they still use BDD so that's why we took away the term BDD. They're, just, they're, they're still a test at the end of the day. But we're just applying those same principles we do to the actual integration tests. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, just was, I was wondering, why wasn't the Big Bang approach a viable option? Why wouldn't it just... Um, no, there's a legacy for it. Yeah, okay, um, like, obviously know. we still had deadlines to meet and we still had projects to deliver. So we didn't want to jeopardise those projects for, for a bit of improvement. So we thought we'd just try, let's try do bits at a time and see how we go. And at the end, if it's small enough, we might have a little more projects to, to get rid of it. I mean, not to mention the fact that you clearly learned a lot of stuff as you were going. Yeah. If you just flipped a switch and did it all up front, you would never have, you, you would have had a complete disaster. Yeah. And not just that, but carrying carrying that improvement on yeah, as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, again, from previous experience, uh, uh, previous employment, we actually did the big bank, big bank approach. We approached it as, as a project on its own. We implemented the tool, we had a project manager, we, you know, it was its own project. And, in a way it was successful, we automated the application under test, but then the project finished. Who takes ownership of those scripts? Um, so the, the way that we approach it is working it into business as usual. It is really the only way to keep that ownership up. Um, so did you change the tool by any chance you were working it before? Or no, same tool, same. So if no, this is a totally new tool. So there was just, we had to get away from that because there wasn't enough knowledge on that tool to support us going forward. By changing our tool set to a .NET framework, we are able to involve all the developers as well to help us develop quicker because all the QA didn't have that technical knowledge at that time. So that's why to get more people involved in the journey, the easier it becomes if everyone's committed to the same one. Oh, sorry. Some people believe it's a report you're talking about. Yep. Interesting that you told me that how you got a business case to Do, do you want to answer that part of the question? Talk, talk about how we go. I was just going to say talk to you later. So. <laughs> but I thought it was going to be later. <laughs> Not now. Um, that decision was actually made before I got here, so I can't be the say why I chose, but we actually used some, because some of the, these tests were already written before we started, but 
then obviously as we got better with it, we actually found improvements that we can make. I think the key thing to point out is um, it became clearer and clearer that there was a problem with, with the legacy test rate. It wasn't reliable, lots of false negatives, it was essentially a waste of time. And, I think, and again, that's a pretty common story um, with, the, with the big kind of um, record and play um, test automation suits. So really, you know, as Mike said, the, the decision was made quite a while ago, but it did come from top down. But you know, we need we need better quality. You know, we need better confidence in our test automation. So that kind of um, work is made into me. Right, I think that we might end it there. Um, thank you so much, Mike and Rob.